afternoon. It's great to have you here uh, for, for this great conversation that we're about to have. Um, my name is Father Eddie Siebert. I'm the rector of the LMU Jesuit community, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to our uh, Jesuit conversations uh, that's been taking place here during the semester, and we're thrilled tonight with two very special guests. Uh, tonight's topic is called Healing a Divided Church Through Synodality. The event is sponsored by the Catholic Studies Program, the CSJ Center for Reconciliation and Justice, the Office of the Chancellor, and Mike, why don't you stand so people know who you are as Chancellor? <laughs> and of course, the Jesuit community. So we're thrilled to have you here as well as our guests. Carol Costello is an award-winning journalist and former anchor and correspondent at CNN and HLN. Her distinguished career as a local, regional, and national broadcaster spans three decades, covering a broad range of world leaders, events, and politics. She has won an Emmy Award for her reporting on the crack cocaine epidemic, a DuPont for her coverage of the Indonesian tsunami, and two Emmy Award nominations for broadcast performance and best morning show. Carol also participated in CNN's Peabody award-winning coverage of Hurricane Katrina and covered the 2008 the 2016 presidential elections. She now produces the award-winning true crime podcast, Blind Rage, and teaches journalism here at Loyola Marymount University. Good to have you here, Carol. And Father James Martin is a Jesuit priest, editor-at-large of America Magazine, consultant to the Vatican Secretariat for Communications, and author of numerous books, including the New York Times bestsellers, Jesus of Pilgrimage, and the Jesuit Guide to Almost Everything. Among his other books, My Life with the Saints and Between Heaven and Mirth, were named by Publishers Weekly as Best Books of the Year, and three of his books have received Christopher Awards. Father Martin is a frequent commentator in the national and international media, having appeared on all the major networks and in such diverse outlets as The Colbert Report, Fresh Air, On Being, Fox and Friends, PBS's NewsHour, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, and The Boston Globe, as well as on the History Channel, BBC, Vatican Radio, and even Loyal Productions. Long time ago. That was a long time ago. Before entering the Jesuits in 1988, he graduated from the Wharton School of Business. Please welcome Father Jim Martin. <laughs> You can stay here. So tonight's program, just so all of you know, I know he's eager, isn't he? No, Father Martin is gonna open us up with some comments about his experience in Rome during the Synod. And then uh, Carol is going to uh, continue with some poignant questions. And then around 6.20, I'll open up the floor for anyone who has questions here. And uh, we should conclude by 6.30, but again, welcome. And it's great to have you, so Father Martin. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wonderful to be here. Uh, wonderful to be back at LMU. Uh, thank you, Eddie. Uh, thank you for the to the Jesuit community, and uh, thank you, Carol, for uh, hosting this discussion. So, very briefly, what I'd like to do now is just give you a little overview. I'm going to take my watch off so I don't go over the two hours that I allotted myself. Um, uh, a little overview of just what the synod was like and the kind of logistics of the synod. Uh, so, for those of you who don't no, or aren't familiar, uh, uh, I'm going to say John Paul Francis called the Synod in 2021, uh, and it started with discussions at the parish level and at the diocesan level uh, around the world. Now, there are some complaints that my diocese didn't uh, participate, my parish didn't participate, but, uh, you know, in a sense, it's not surprising that it uh, is kind of a, it was a slow going process, because this is the first time that this kind of widespread consultation has happened. In fact, someone at the Senate said it is probably the large in history, probably the largest consultative gathering in world history, which is probably true. I mean, these are parishes all over the world participated in it. So uh, after the parishes participated, those um, uh, the results of the different uh, discussions were brought to the diocesan level and were coordinated into diocesan reports about topics of concern for Catholics. Uh, those were then brought together. Uh, at the bishops conference level or the episcopal conference level here the u.s conference of catholic bishops who provided a summary which uh, if you read the usccb summary was quite blunt 
quite honest, uh, quite open. Uh, for those people who were suspicious or um, doubtful that it would be open, uh, it was very, it's a very open document that the bishops produced. Uh, and then they gathered them together in what was called the continental level, so North America and Africa and Europe. And then those were all brought together in what was called the working document uh, in Rome, also the instrumentum laboris, which sounds much more impressive than the working document. Everyone always said the instrumentum laboris. Um, and then that served, uh, the, the title of the instrumentum laboris was enlarge the space of your tent, which is a really wonderful image that I'd frankly never heard before, uh, really bringing people in. That's part of Francis's visions for the church. Uh, and then that working document served as the basis for our discussions. Now, it all sounds very boring, uh, but basically those the, the topics that were discussed in the working documents became the topics that were discussed by, uh, as they were called, which I love, the Synod Fathers and Mothers, which is nice. So in Vatican, the Second Vatican Council was the Council Fathers, right? And so now we have the Synod Fathers and Mothers. By the way, those of us who were appointed who are not bishops were referred to during the synod, uh, and it just sort of started to become the the, the nomenclature, the non-bishops, you know. The, so will the non-bishops do X, Y, Z, and the bishops do this? So who was there? So 350 people were there. Um, most of them were appointed by bishops' conferences, uh, so bishops and, and lay people, uh, as well as heads of Roman dicasteries, also formally called uh, secretariats or congregations. Uh, and then Pope Francis uh, himself uh, appointed 70 people. I was one of the 70 people he appointed. He, he could have appointed as many as he wanted to, but he appointed 70. One of the surprises for me uh, was that it was primarily bishops. I think for those of us who are interested in the church, when the uh, lists came out, everyone went right to the, the non-bishops, right? Like uh, who's, who's going, who's not going. But when you walked into the, um, the aula, the, the great aula where it took place in Vatican City, it was 75% cardinals, archbishops, and bishops. So it was still very much a bishops conference. Um, one of the most important uh, innovations of this synod uh, was that there were, as you probably know, laymen and laywomen there for the first time who had full voting rights, which was wonderful. Uh, as well as priests and members of religious orders, who then we non bishops uh, had as much right to speak, to vote, uh, as the Cardinal Archbishop of whatever ancient see. So it was really pretty exciting. Um, so, what happened? Well, the first three days, uh, we were on a retreat at a place called Sacrofano outside of Rome, which turned out to be a big kind of a conference center. I thought Sacrofano was some Italian name for something sacred. We're going to Sacrofano. It's like, no, it's a town outside of Rome. Um, and we were all together. And uh, Father Timothy Radcliffe uh, was our retreat master, who was excellent. And one of the things I want to say was he set the tone for me and for so many other people by saying, what are we doing here, this first session? Uh, we are becoming friends. That's the goal. And you could feel people kind of say, what? And Timothy said, um, you know, people, you're going to go back home and people are going to say people flew 10,000 miles just to be, become friends with people in, in Rome. And the answer is yes, because as he quoted St. John Paul II, I just love this. For me, this was the synod. Affective collegiality precedes effective collegiality. Isn't that great? I can hear people nodding. Yeah. So you cannot talk about difficult topics if you're not friends with people. And so the first session was really about that, you know, according to him. Uh, so we had these three days. There was also an Italian sister named Mother Ignatius Angelina who gave her uh, uh, points for reflection. And then we began. So what was it like? Well, we you walk into the Aula Paolo Sesto. I love saying that better than the Paul the Sixth Paul. The Aula Paolo Sesto, which sounded like an Italian dessert. I'll have an Aula Paolo Sesto again, um, or a drink or a cocktail. And um, there were, you probably saw, I probably should have brought uh, pictures, probably the, the most uh, vivid image and message of the synod was the image of 35 tables with 12 people sitting around each table. Former uh, synods were organized just like this hall is. So the Pope would be up there, the head of the synod, this guy, this guy, this guy, all guys, of course. 
and then there were all the cardinals and archbishops and bishops, and someone would come up to the podium and give his four-minute talk and then sit down. Those were the former synods. At this synod, we were all seated around round tables, which was very exciting. Now, what happened? We started with a prayer, of course, and then we were given the topic for the week. So we had four modules or weeks, and we were given a topic. Uh, so, for example, communion, participation, mission. But one of my topics was, how does the church uh, bring together love and truth? And you would think, well, that's kind of boring. But, of course, you get very much into quickly kind of, you know, all right, how do we proclaim the truth by what, while being compassionate to people on the ground? You can imagine where those conversations go. We started with prayer. And then I just want to talk briefly about this um, uh, method, methodology. They love the word over there in Italy, the methodology of conversations in the spirit and how it how it worked and in terms of healing the church i think this is pretty brilliant so you had people from all over the world i mean literally all over the world from a variety of backgrounds a cardinal uh, an aboriginal representative from australia a 22 year old young woman from a villanova university a, a, a woman theologian i mean just all of it from you know from bulgaria and australia and syria everywhere and how would we be able to talk about these sometimes controversial topics? Well, the methodology was pretty brilliant. The first round was everyone went around their table and had four minutes to speak. And here's the most important part. No one could interrupt. <laughs> so you would have a 22-year-old college student speaking about her idea of the church to cardinals, archbishops, bishops, priests, theologians, and no one could interrupt. It was pretty brilliant. Then we would pause for prayer. And then the second round was everyone reflected on what they heard, what struck them. Also, no one can interrupt. And we had a facilitator at the table. And if someone did interrupt, they were stopped. And people don't interrupt. It wasn't rude. But, you know, people say, oh, you know, in my diocese. And one of my favorite quotes from the Synod, which uh, was, happened at my table, was someone was talking and someone, you know, just wanted to say, oh, well, yeah, uh, your eminence, she hasn't finished yet. That has not been said in any synod in history. And it was very healthy. Uh, and then the third round was free flowing conversation where you could challenge people and ask questions. Uh, and then we, at the end of the week, uh, had a secretary and what was called a rapporteur, uh, who would summarize uh, what we had discussed. And let me tell you, these people at the Synod, they're all experts and they all came prepared. So when people would speak their four minutes, it was usually written. It was very well prepared. People knew that this was their, you know, as they say in Hamilton, don't miss your shot. This was their time. And so it was very moving how committed people were. Uh, then the report would be said to the plenary session. All of us had uh, TV screens in front of us. It was pretty brilliant so that uh, there were multiple languages. Uh, we had English, French, Italian, uh, Spanish, and a Portuguese table, right? And so you had language groups. And when someone would stand up, there would be simultaneous translation. So you would hear the report of the group. So uh, at the end of the week, each of the tables would report. And so you had a sense of exactly what was going on and how the Spirit was moving people. That was one of Pope Francis's lines, you know, the protagonist is the Holy Spirit. Right. That, that is who the protagonist is. This is not a parliament. This, we're, we're listening to the voice of the spirit. And then uh, at the end of the day, um, uh, people would be able to do what were called, uh, uh, what was it called? Free speech. So anyone could speak to the entire body, which was pretty amazing. First come, first serve. And so if you're the Cardinal Archbishop of whatever, and, and, and by the way, once you've spoken, you go back down the line. So if you're the Cardinal Archbishop of whatever or the secret the the prefect of this congregation and you've you've talked, you go back down the line and you wait your turn with everybody else. It was it's pretty amazing. And people would get up and just speak about what was important to them. And I found that extremely moving. Towards the end, uh, the fourth week, uh, they had theologians and writers gather together all of the reports and put them into what was called the synthesis report, which you can read. Uh, and which is a, a fair statement of kind of where we were and what we decided. That synthesis report 
is now being used in parishes and dioceses for more reflection, and that will also kind of go up. And we'll go back in October. It was just announced that we'll be going back for another month uh, and then finish up, present it to the Holy Father, and then he will decide what to do. So it is it is consultative and it is widely consultative. It was, and I'll just say, I mean, Carol will, will talk about it uh, after this, but I found it very exciting. Found it very exciting, very positive, very hopeful. And uh, uh, I think it was hard for a lot of people. Uh, one of the questions was, is this a synod of bishops when we have non-bishops here? That was a little bit of a pushback. What is this? Where are we going? But it was like seeing kind of history, you know, being made as we were moving on. Anyway, so that's a little bit of a pricey of what happened and how we did things. And now I'm happy to have a little conversation. Okay. Yes, we are on. Um, I liked when you said that it was like talking with friends and you could disagree, but we don't really do that today. So I, I'm impressed if that actually happened. Like, wasn't it tense at times at the Yes. Senate? Is this on? Yes, it was tense. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't want it to seem like uh, everything was happy, clappy, and we all, oh, that's wonderful. Uh, I think that the greatest tension was uh, around LGBT issues, LGBTQ issues. That was tense because, you know, there are people from uh, different parts of the world and uh, even from this part of the world who don't agree with certain other approaches to things. That was quite tense. I would say there was some tension over this idea of what is this? Is this a bishop's conference? Is this a bishop's synod? Because we have, and the bishops would say this, we have non-bishops here, not in a, not in a pejorative way. Uh, and so there was some tension around that. There was some tension around women's issues. Um, but people, I think one of the great things was you were encouraged to talk to people with whom you disagreed. And that conversations in the spirit was really helpful because you couldn't just cut somebody off. You really had to listen to what they were saying. And then, oh, I forgot. I'm glad you brought this up. I forgot one of the most brilliant parts of the synod. The, the, the rapporteur uh when he or she usually she presented the results of the table discussions to the group i should have said this earlier they care they categorized them in four ways convergences divergences tensions and questions so there was no uh sort of forced false consensus that's what i was like how are we going to how are we going to agree well we didn't agree and you would say, here's where we agreed, here's where we disagreed, here's where we had tensions, and then here's here were the questions we had. So that, I think, in terms of healing, that was extremely helpful. There was no, there was no just like, let's force ourselves or take a vote. No, it was here's where we are. So that, that, that enabled people to speak freely. So before we dive deeper into that, you know, I've always wondered this about you. <laughs> you minister to LBGTQ Catholics, and you're not shy about criticizing some in the far right. In fact, you're quite outspoken. There are less controversial ways to minister. Why did you choose this way? Yeah, I try not to ever critique people personally. I never will do that, like so-and-so is whatever. Um, I try to always do it from the standpoint of the gospel and the standpoint of Jesus who sticks up for people on the margins. Uh, and as to, you know, why I don't feel like I chose this ministry, I ended up sort of being drawn into it. Uh, if for people who have known me for a long time, I'm not a controversialist. So this was, this is new for me. And yet you are controversial. And yet I am. Uh, it's very strange. It's a very strange experience to go from just being a Jesuit priest who happens to write to people hating you. I mean, really, I was I was accosted on the street in Italy uh, by some guy who just was haranguing me. And, you know, some of the synod members were walking by. One of them was like, Father James, are you OK? Um, and I was like, yeah, I'm kind of used to this. So it's uh, I think it just goes with what, the territory. You're kind of used to it? It, it. I mean, it's been that bad that you've become. Oh, it's yeah. It's become normal. Mm -hmm. That's disturbing. Yeah, it is. It is. but. I think that just goes with the ministry and, you know, our model as Jesuits and as Christians is Jesus. And this is what he experienced. And so, and then as a Jesuit, you, in the spiritual exercises, you pray for humiliations uh, in order to be 
No, you do in order to be um, closer to Jesus. Uh, so. so so, do you think that's one of the reasons why Pope Francis chose you to take part in the Synod? Yes. Yeah, I think that I didn't ask him directly. I had some time with him beforehand. Um, but I didn't want to ask him that, you know, why did you? But I think so. Uh, I, I will share. <laughs> I guess I can share this. Are we, is this being taped? Is it being taped? Then I won't share it. Um, no, I believe that he, um, I think that's probably the reason. Yeah. So you go into the Senate knowing that the Pope chose you for a certain reason, and you know that some people that are participating are going to view you with great suspicion. What was that like? Uh, it was odd. <laughs> um, I didn't, I would say this, I would say, let's just say, to take it away from me, um, I would say roughly 80% of the people there, I think this is fair, were of the mind that we need to reach out to the LGBTQ community. I think that's fair. So bishops and, you know, lay people and priests. So so that, that the majority of people that sent it were like, how can we do this? But then the question is that love and truth question. How, how do we do it? Um, I would say 10% of the people were suspicious and 10% of the people were hostile. And I mean, hostile. I did listen to an interview that you did online that said one person refused to sit next to you and actually left the room. That is correct. Well, how did you handle that and how did that feel? Uh, well, um, trying to think what I can say. I, I, I credit my Jesuit formation for uh, helping me to think about being free of the need for everyone to like me. Uh, and so I realized at that moment when this person uh, said that he refused to sit next to me at the it's the synod after all. And I thought to myself, you know, even if you think I'm a sinner, you're supposed to sit with me, right? I mean, this is what Jesus did. So I knew that at the moment, the best thing to do was nothing, which is often the best thing to do. So I just sat there and, and continued and he left. How and did the others react? They were... Um, they were, what's the word I want to use? Disappointed. I mean, he was the only one that left. <laughs> At least it was only one, right? Yeah, and he left for the duration of the synod. Really? Mm -hmm. so, so I know you, know, I, I, like, and I don't want to make it all a downer because you talked a lot about the positive very things. That yeah, this is like one guy, so. <laughs> so. So is that sort of thing helpful in kind of a strange way? I suppose that's a, you're, you're definitely a journalist. I really can. This is the difference between doing it with, you know, like a theologian or, or this is, this is now you're very good. This, this is a very good, this is a journalist. The Jesuits did invite <laughs> you. No, exactly. <laughs> um, I think it was good. All right. I, I, what do I think about him leaving? I think it was bad because it was against the spirit of the synod. I think there was a, if there was any good in it, it revealed to people how deep the, uh, suspicion around this particular issue was. And, and it sort of reflects the divisions within the Catholic Church. It does, although there were other people who were probably just as vociferous about their uh, opposition to the kind of ministry that I and others do. I was not the only one that did LGBTQ ministry there, uh, but he was the only one that chose to let, to leave. So, in a, in a sense, it was good to have that revealed. And also people saw it. I guess I can say, you know, this wasn't private. This was the whole Aula saw him storm out. Um, some who participated were, um, I guess they shared publicly what they were not supposed to, yes. which is also interesting. Why would they do that? So first of all, a little background. So uh, Pope Francis, uh, this was somewhat controversial. There were many journalists in Rome, uh, as you know, a lot of that, as they say, Vaticanistas, uh, the journalists who cover the Vatican, uh, as well as journalists from overseas who came, because, you know, it's big, as they say, the largest, most important gathering since the Second Vatican Council, supposedly. Uh, and Pope Francis decided that it would be, it would be confidential, it would be secret. Now, a lot of people were discouraged about that. And initially, I thought, you know what, that does not make sense. 
because the whole point is transparency in the church. The whole point is enabling the people of God to follow along what's going on. And the reporters want to communicate this to the people of God. But then I realized what it enabled was people to speak freely. That's what happened. And so if you if this thing is live streamed, people are not going to speak freely and it's going to be just sort of bland. So I think in the end, it actually was the right decision. But there were um, two or three people that actually gave interviews during the Synod. And for me, I'll just speak personally, it was very weird to come in the next day and. OK, good morning. You know, and everybody had read the thing that well, I can say that Cardinal Mueller said because it was it's online, it's public. And there he was the next morning. So I would just say I didn't understand that. I tried to be assiduous about not saying anything public. And particularly, you were particularly not supposed to say, you know, Eddie Siebert said this, Father Siebert, excuse me, you know, Father Siebert said this or Cardinal so-and-so said this. And then so-and-so responded. You were specifically not supposed to say that. Um, yeah, I, I can't speak for them. Well, I don't know. One of the comments out there came from um, the Cameroon Archbishop. Um, after taking part in the Synod, he called gay unions witchcraft. And as you said, for the first time, lay people and women were included in the Synod. And he said he poo-pooed their presence and said the dogs are barking, the caravan is moving on. In other words, yeah, they participated, but nobody's really listening. So I would say one of the good things about that coming out is it gives you a flavor of the kinds of things that were said on the floor of the Senate. People were very blunt. Is and that good? I think it is good. I think because this is the first time we're meeting together, right, as, as really open and as church and as with women, that was a huge part of the Senate. Um, and so... It's not surprising that the first time we meet, there are all these kind of explosive issues. It's, it's. I think also for some bishops, this is probably the first time that they've been uh, sometimes challenged by by different voices and from overseas and from women and from LGBTQ advocates and and that's hard, right? And so I think it's a kind of it's a kind of opening up. Um, but that 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 kind of. Uh, approach and language gives you a sense of what it was like to hear those things and he, he was well anyway yeah. <laughs> well you know they say in journalism if you make everyone unhappy you're doing your job so um, there is a sense that no one was quite happy with the results of the synod um, because of the synthesis statement that 42 page report that was given over to the pope progressive catholics weren't happy because the term lbgtq was not used um, and it didn't really address women's empowering women within the church either. It was sort of vague. Yeah, actually, I, that I would disagree with. I think that, um, uh, okay, I, I think the synthesis document was very long, first of all, which, as you said, 42 pages. Uh, but I think that th there were so, some issues. I think it did a good job of reflecting the kind of conversations that we had at the Senate, but there were some issues that were pretty out there. Um, look, I think that from both progressive and traditional, the, the response that does, I don't like the most, and this is just personal, is, as you said, is not enough. You know, it's not enough. There should have been more of this. There should have been more of that. Let's just take those two issues that I think were the most uh, controversial. So women. In the situation of women, the we talked about, and the synthesis document calls for more discussion about women's ordination to the diaconate, not weasel words like women leadership roles but the diaconate and that's in the synthesis document and that's pretty out there you know for a lot of people and as far as the i don't want to talk all about lgbt stuff but as far as that goes what happened was um each of the um paragraphs had to be voted on by the whole body and they had to pass by i think two-thirds so we read through kind of numbingly 42 pages of paragraphs you know we voted um the writers realized that if they put the words LGBTQ in, in the places where they were talking about sex, uh, sexuality and gender, it would have been voted down. And so they kept out that term. But if you read, I think it's parts 15, 16, and 17, they talk about uh, 
moving towards a new anthropology to help us understand certain concepts and relying on the people that we're talking about, listening to them. And they say gender and sexuality. And in the Italian, there are two official versions, English and Italian. It says uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. So it actually does kind of push things. The other thing is the, the, the synod, I think, was more about the church ad intra. So it was about uh, partic lay participation, um, the, the role of the bishops, uh, the role of women. So I think that there weren't as many kind of sexy issues, if you you know excuse the phrase, for 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 the sort of general consumption of people and certainly the media. But actually, I think if you read the synthesis document, you say, wow, this is a great starting place for for part two. Um, I was I was in general, I was I was pretty happy with that. I think it was too long. That's the only problem, if you know. Well, Catholics, right? Yes. <laughs> I know. Yes. Um, so you're going to meet again in October, yes. next October. So after that, I mean, what's next? Like, can you make any predictions over the next five years of any real changes that will occur within our faith? I think that, uh, so what's going to happen next? We don't know. The Holy Spirit uh, kind of takes charge. The next session, I think we're we're going to be focused on certain topics. Uh, there's, there's going to be discussions now uh, in the next few months based on the reaction from parishes and dioceses, uh, whereby uh, people in Rome will say, now these are the topics we want to really focus on, right? So not just kind of more vague topics. And I think that um, the, the other thing was, there's a lot in that document that's kind of buried in there. Tom Reese from RNS, a former editor of America, had a great thing about 15 hidden gems in the Synod document. And there are some things that, just like a line or two, for example, I didn't know this before I went. Did you know that in every uh, uh, parish, uh, there's there needs to be a finance committee, right? That's 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 in canon law. There does not need to be a parish council. So one of the lines is that should be included in canon law. So something that seems small and throwaway that could actually really change a lot of things. Um, I think, I don't want to predict too much, but I think you could see a change in two areas. One, I think just in the synods in general, one bishop said, we can't go back to the old way. It's unthinkable. It's unthinkable that we wouldn't have women there. That's that's a big change, right? Now, there were some that were resisting that. The other one is around women. I think that there's a lot of movement around women's ordination to the diaconate. And I was very surprised. I think I can say this. I was very surprised how much, at least on the floor, consensus there seemed to be. Where the LGBTQ issue was quite explosive, the ordination of women to the deck, and it was just, we're going to talk about it. And I, that was very interesting to me. I could not have predicted that because I thought there would be this pushback. So those are two areas, the, the role of bishops and synods and women, which would be great steps forward uh, as I see them. Um, I, I want to focus now on the ongoing divisions within the church and how we might heal those divisions. Um, so I'll ask a basic question. How would you characterize the divide in the church? Oh, gosh. Uh, I would say, I guess it depends where you are. I would say in the United States, uh, oh, gosh, what word would I use? Tragic. Sometimes poisonous. I was very sad and am sad when I see the number of church leaders publicly opposing Pope Francis in the way that they do. Let's put it that way. And that to me is, I think that some of the, I don't want to name people, but I think that some of the same groups that said under St. John Paul and Benedict XVI that you could never critique a pope are now critiquing Pope Francis like he is just this piece of dirt. And it's just shocking. It's shocking to me. There is actually a YouTube video online from a priest. He's on camera in a collar calling for the murder of Pope Francis. Yeah. It's just insane. Where does that come from and who makes that okay? All right. So, and I don't mean to be, uh, this is not dismissive in any way. Where it comes from is the evil spirit. That is that is directly from the evil spirit, as I see it, in terms of, so St. Ignatius says, what does the good spirit do? The good spirit builds up, it, it consoles, it helps us, it brings together, the bad spirit tears apart, you know, causes us despair. I think what's happened, I mean, we all know the history, 
I mean, I'm talking to people who know it better than I do. Um, I think that for the most part, under St. John Paul and Benedict, uh, cardinals and archbishops and bishops were appointed uh, in to sort of, how would I say this? Um, for, for certain issues, right? There were certain issues that were considered important. And Francis has changed those. I mean, they all, obviously, they all believe in the creed and all that kind of stuff. Nothing's really changed in terms of church teaching. But his focus, his emphasis has shifted. And as Tom Reese said, which I thought was very brilliant, it's very much like in any company. When a new boss comes in, it's confusing to people who were hired by the old boss, right? And I think there was a great deal of continuity between St. John Paul and Benedict. Now, there is continuity. You don't want to say you know, Benedict and then Francis and everything changed. There's a lot of continuity, but it is true that he is focusing, focusing, focusing on different things. In the first article that he, uh, first interview he had that was published in America Magazine and other Jesuit publications, he said, it is something like a school teacher who says, all right, now we understand these topics. We're moving on to new ones, right? And I think that's very threatening to people. Uh, and it makes them angry. Change makes people angry. But the the vitriol is something different. And I think uh, it, a lot of it has to do with just cultural factors. I think social media has a lot to do with it. And I think, unfortunately, particularly in the United States, it's okay to hate people again, which is very sad. So, And particularly in the church. Now, I think for me, Francis models um, not responding, you know, and just not answering. And it's, it's, uh, it's I think it's admirable. But it it pains me, and I would say this to to people who said that about John Paul or Benedict. I couldn't, I wouldn't imagine people would say things like that. So it's it's really it's really kind of disappointing and uh, sad. Some some say the biggest rift inside our church is the ill will of Pope Francis's enemies and American politics. Do you agree with that last part? I would say that I I would say that when you when you drill down past let's say the political the sociological, the ecclesial, the theological, and the spiritual, and you get right down to it, I believe that Pope Francis's opponents, the difference between Pope Francis and his opponents, the very base, is that Pope Francis believes in the activity of the Holy Spirit in the individual conscience, and other people do not hold that in as high regard. So what do I mean by that? So Francis, as a Jesuit, um, uh, was a Jesuit novice director. He was a provincial. He was a spiritual director. He has accompanied people um, in their spiritual lives. Um, by the way, is, this is being recorded, right? Yeah, okay, good. So I can. He has accompanied people in their spiritual lives. And so he knows the activity of the spirit and the person, right? The individual, and he reverences that as all, I would say all Jesuits do, and hopefully most people in this room, that the individual conscience, as the Second Vatican Council said, the informed conscience is the final arbiter of the moral life, all right? So he really reverences that. If you look at places where people who really disagree with Pope Francis, Amoris Laetitia, right? This new document, Fiducia Supplicans, the Synod, it comes down to, well, if you're going to listen to people, then anything goes. It's baloney, right? Oh, is that, is that it? Anything goes. So whatever you say is, 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 is okay. Rather than saying, no, this is an activity of the Holy Spirit, right? In the Morris Laetitia, he talks about the value of conscience, right? And, 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 and so he, and people say, well, that, that's terrible. Anything goes. No, no, it's not. It's, it's respecting conscience. Uh, in LGBTQ issues, particularly in the Synod, it's, it's frightening to people to think that the Holy Spirit would ask us to do something different. So I think that's the fundamental difference, because when you listen carefully, that's usually what people say. He's confusing people. Anything goes. Uh, there are no rules anymore. No, it's listening to the Holy Spirit. And I, I was just going to follow selective. up on that very thing that um, some people believe he's he's ambiguous about things. He says things that are confusing. You know, a few examples on on celibacy. You know, ahead of the synod, the pope says there was no clear and authoritative doctrine, but then he ruled against allowing married priests in the Amazon, mm -hmm. and that just confuses people. Like, which is it? Is yeah. that his? Why does he do that? Is that his leadership style? Well, I think part of it is uh, he is trying to uh, minister to the church worldwide, 
right? And so part of it's his discernment. So we have to trust in the grace of office with his discernment that he feels that this is not the right time in Carita Amazonia for, for married priests, even though that document came at the, the, the synod on the Amazon was pretty strong about that. So I think we have to trust his discernment as well. Um, and I think he's okay with that ambiguity. I, I think, you know, at the beginning of uh, his papacy, he said, you know, one of the things we're meant to do is make a mess. The Holy Spirit is kind of, uh, by its very nature, confusing and, and asks us to See, change. See, that is so different for me, right? Mm -hmm. So I grew up Catholic. Mm -hmm. Everything's black and white. Yeah. I like Pope Francis because everything's not black and white. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's confusing for many Catholics. It is. Yeah, no, it is. And I think it is. Yeah, it is. When it, we is have... it because we're not used to a Jesuit leader? Is he? Di is I, that different? Uh, I'm just, I, no, I, I know. I mean, I love Jesuits. I'm here at LMU, but I'm just saying. I think since the Second Vatican Council until Francis, I really believe that I'm not a theologian. There are lots of great theologians here. But I believe that there has been a kind of diminution in the emphasis placed on the importance of conscience. And so what has happened over time, the last 30 or 40 years, is that people have, you know, like you were saying, people have been convinced that Catholicism is really about following rules. That's it. It's about, and it's also about an identity. If you do this, you're a good Catholic. If you do that, you're a bad Catholic. Okay. And we've never really followed. Right. Well, but, but, you know, I, I think, you know, people, and this is sincerely held, right? This is, this is, this is the kind of, unfortunately, I think, you know, and then look, there are rules, right? There are rules, good and bad. I'm not trying to say that black and white, right? Sometimes there are, there's good and bad, but the, the Catholic church is, and, and the Christian religion is about an encounter with a person, the mystery of Jesus Christ, right? It is not about ticking off boxes and neither was Jesus. And so that is threatening to people because it invites them into a level of participation and discernment that is difficult. So what am I meant to do with my uh, gay son? What am I meant to do with my divorced and remarried friends? What am I meant to do in a company where my manager is not paying me a just wage, right? These are difficult questions that you can't just open a book and find an answer to. It, it, what is your discernment? Where is the Holy Spirit? What is the church? What does the gospel say? What is church teaching? What does your conscience say? These are hard questions for people. And I think, unfortunately, many Catholics have fallen back on this yes and no black and white, which I don't think is sort of fully uh, appreciative of the mystery of Christ and the Holy Spirit who is still at work. So it is, it's difficult. And I think people react against that. The other thing is when they've been told that black Catholic, being Catholic is black and white and yes or no, and someone comes along like Francis and says, no, we need to use our conscience, it's threatening. So who is responsible for repairing the rift within the church? Who should lead that besides Pope Francis? Well, I think everybody here, everyone in the church, I think it's all our responsibility. Um, How do we do that? I think what, you know, I, I have to say, I think there, there's one thing I point to from the Jesuits, from the spiritual exercises, and it is what's called the presupposition of the spiritual exercises, which is, this is a very strange thing. And so the spiritual exercises are St. Ignatius's uh, map for a four-week retreat where you come to know Jesus better, imagine it to prayer and help to, helps you to make decisions. At the very beginning, there's something called the presupposition. Now, you would think the presupposition of the spiritual exercises would be Jesus Christ is Lord, or the Blessed Mother prays for us, or something like that. Or the presupposition of the spiritual exercises is every good Christian ought to be more willing to put a good interpretation on someone's uh, actions and words than, than not. That's the presupposition for the exercises, which is for the retreatant and the retreat director. But it really is a presupposition for the Christian life, putting, as one old Jesuit used to say, the plus sign, listening to people. It is called giving people the benefit of the doubt. That's one thing to do. So we can start doing that in the church, all of us, me included, right, with people who feel like they're on the other side, even though I hate that expression. And then the second thing, I think this, this these conversations in the spirit are brilliant. 
and it is actually listening to people. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give you an example. There was a fellow, a, a cardinal, uh, who made an intervention that was I found quite um, uh, I would say almost the polar opposite of what I think about LGBTQ people. It was blunt. It was um, it was direct. It was uh, loud. It was it was really I would say I would consider harsh. So the wonderful thing about the synod is I went up to him afterwards and we had a great conversation. Now we didn't convince each other, right? But I listened to him at the very end. Um, I said, let's take a picture. He said, I'd love to take a picture. I said, can I share that on social media? Absolutely. We didn't, we didn't agree. I mean, I really, we really completely disagreed, but we were brothers. We broke bread together. We took communion together, and I think that's a great way to start. But it's it's hard. It's easier to just demonize somebody, and all of us in this room have at one point demonized other people, right? Online, in person, in our parishes, it's very easy to do that. And I will say, it was, I think, one of the hardest things about being at the synod was the invitation, which I felt from the Holy Father, the Holy Spirit, from everyone around me to really go to people who were completely opposed to the kind of stuff that I've been doing and talk to them and really listen. Not like this, you know, or not like, you know, like I'm gonna, I mean, really listen. One of the things that I had to listen to was and had to learn from was many of the delegates felt that LGBTQ ideology was uh, an ideology that is a form of colonialism that is being imposed by the West on certain countries that do not want it. Okay, now I don't agree with that, but I had to listen to these people and I wanted to listen to these people. I know that sounds very passionate, but I really wanted to know where they came from and to hear them and to, I don't understand what you mean by that. Can you tell me, even though it was difficult and they listened to me, so that's a start, right? It doesn't solve everything, but that's what Timothy Radcliffe was talking about. Affective collegiality begins with, uh, be, precedes effective collegiality. We may never agree, but we're brothers and sisters. Um, I wanna to touch a little bit about young people fleeing religion because they're fleeing all religion. Why do you think that is? Oh my gosh, the, the, they saw the nuns and the duns. Have you heard that? <clears throat> so yes, the nuns are N-O-N-E-S. Yeah, N-O-N-E-S, the nuns, people with no religious affiliation, the duns, people are just done. Uh, gosh, I would say, let's just stick with the United States, because I uh, I would say, first of all, it's just rising secularism. So the, so as, this, as the culture becomes more secular, young people become more secular. Okay, that's the first thing. I'm not a sociologist, so this is just me. Second, I think that there are good reasons why people feel that the Catholic Church has abandoned them. The sex abuse crisis is a huge thing. I mean, it's just huge. Um, and then I think uh, time. I think people are getting busier, uh, and I think COVID did not help that. There was a dramatic drop-off in mass attendance, as you know. Some incredible figure, like 30%, I think. At American Media, where I work, we would have conversations during COVID and I love all the people I work with. They're wonderful. And people would say, people desire community. And when the churches open up, they're going to flood back. And I said, are you kidding? You know, they can do it online now. So I think all those things, but I think it's just a kind of creeping secularism. Now, that is not, now, that is not the case elsewhere. In sub-Saharan Africa and other places, things are booming. Uh, and so that's, so it's just, it, we have to, be, you know, be careful not to say well, like the whole church. So, some of these contentious issues, um, young people are all for and fully embracing gay Catholics, for mm -hmm. example, um, women in the church, for example. And and I'm, I just want to ask you this one controversial question, and it is controversial, um, at least within our faith. The Supreme Court, uh, with Catholic pro-life justices, the majority overturned Roe v. Wade despite a disconnect with the views of the majority of young people. And that's just true. How has that decision impacted Catholicism, if at all? That's an interesting question. So 
How has the the Dobbs decision impacted Catholicism? That's interesting. Um, gosh. Because I, I yeah. have never heard young people talk as much about that issue as I do today. In the church or? No, just. Oh, I see. Yeah. I, I'm being sincere here. I don't think it has a. That's an interesting. I, I, I'm Look, I'm not a. I, I'm going to say something that most Jesuits don't say, which is I don't know. Um, I would say. Maybe people disagree. I would say it hasn't really changed the church because I think people were either pro-life or pro-choice or whatever you would say in the church. I don't know if that changed things, uh, you know, among Catholics. I think it was more among Americans. It makes the different Americans more likely to vote Democrat or Republican. But I don't know that would say that that would change things in the church. I might be wrong, but yeah. Well, thank you for trying to answer that. Yeah. I appreciate yeah. it. No, I really don't know. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. That's great. We have a few. We have a few minutes, so uh, I'm going to open up the floor. Uh, if you could just raise your hand, and I'll bring up a microphone to you, and we can start with some questions from the floor. Father Martin, you coordinated uh, a conference, a talk with uh, Cardinal Tim Dolan and Stephen Colbert many years ago, um, and it seemed like there was general consensus, not a, a lack of conflict in whatever you discussed at that time. Uh, but I'm not sure I knew everything that happened, but I would ask you to comment on how things were then compared to now. In terms of uh, Cardinal Dolan and Col Colbert? Uh, Cardinal Dolan sat next to me for a week, and he was delightful. Um, if that's what you're talking about. No, I, I, I guess I can say this. Uh, you know, Cardinal Dolan, I consider a friend. He was, I think I can say this, he was delightful to sit next to. He was funny as H-E-double-L. I can't repeat some things he said, but I loved it. I loved sitting next to him. He was funny. He was joyful. Uh, he's a very good priest. Here's one thing I will say. Cardinal Dolan, uh, who's my ordinary, because I live in New York, uh, is a great friend of the Jesuits. Uh, he is a great priest. He, when we were in the synod, my mother's been very sick, which is why, by the way, I'm going to be wearing a mask afterwards. I apologize. Uh, he calls her. Now, look, I'm not a big benefactor. I'm not a bishop. I'm not a someone who's going to, you know, kind of help him or whatever. He calls my mom, talks to her. And when we were at the Synod, I think I can say this. Uh, he said, we're standing, he's very funny. We were standing outside the hall and he goes, let's call La Vecchia, which is the Italians, the old woman. <laughs> and we call her and she's there. Hey, it's Tim Dolan. I'm with your son. You know, he's lovely. He's, I really like him a lot. He's a very, at heart, he is a priest. He is a great priest and a compassionate guy, and I i may not agree with him on everything, but uh, I love sitting next to him. I wish I, I'll tell you afterwards some of his jokes. He was very funny, and uh, I loved it, so. I want to thank you both for a wonderful uh, presentation, and Jim, especially the background, the methodology of the Synod, I found really helpful, you know, trying to bring in all these voices, making sure everybody was heard, that, that was really terrific. But, you, you know, and as, as you, you were talking, I was thinking, you know, the council wanted to decentralize the church, bring in more voices, uh, make it a little less hierarchical. And Pope Paul VI jumped the gun in establishing the synod on his own, and he put it directly under the Pope. And no, who turned it over, of course, to the Curia who controlled the discussions and what they would talk about and what questions would be asked, it totally managed. So most of the bishops said, it's not worthwhile, it's a waste of time. What's The one who objected to that was Joseph Ratzinger, who said this was supposed to be something for the bishops. Now it's an instrument of the papacy. And later on, he said, well, it'll work out, it'll work out. You know, he's very loyal. But what's wonderful about the Synod and what's so encouraging is that while both and I, I must say this, Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict 
re-centralized everything, put more intention, uh, and emphasis back on Rome, it had followed a kind of doctrinal maximalism that was yeah. not helpful. And Francis has said, the spirit works in all of the church. Yeah. We have to bring in all these voices. And the way you presented it, I think, is a good example that this is really on the way. It's going to take a while. We have to learn a new way of being church. Uh, we have to be more open to the spirit. But to me, it's just enormously encouraging. Thank you. That's a very good way of, uh, of, of, of approaching it, which is that we are on the way. And, you know, synod means, synodos means walking along the road together. And it, this is just a beginning. And I think one of the things I do want to say is I want to repeat this that a number of people said, well, there wasn't much participation. It was very small participation. Some parishes, you know, people say, I, I didn't even know about this in my parish or diocese. We're just getting started, right? And he is trying to really, to your point, remind people that the, that the Holy Spirit is active, not just in cardinals and archbishops and bishops. I will say, I think I was saying this at the beginning, there was a real conversation about what is this? Like, is this a synod of bishops? Because juridically, this should be a synod of bishops. And bishops said, well, there are non-bishops here. And at one point, someone said, maybe we should call ourselves the Assembly of the People of God. And there was a big pushback. So imagine changing the title in the middle of the synod. So a uh, very interesting thing happened. I think I can say this. Um, at one point, uh, there was a letter read to us saying that this is a synod of bishops. I think that was made public by Cardinal Grech, who is the secretary general. This is a synod of bishops because there was a lot of discussion. This is it. The next day, the pope made an intervention. He's, he was there, by the way. He was he was in the aula hanging out. I do want to tell you one funny story before we leave. because okay, it's One more question. Yes, one more question. And the pope's next intervention was about the importance of lay people. So it's kind of about, so this is still very much on the way. Yeah, one more question and then a funny story. Hi, thank Hi. you. My name is Merritt Sullivan. I'm the chair of Women's and Gender Studies here and the co-chair of the University Core Curriculum Committee. And I wanted to follow up on um, Carol's question or a couple of them, both about people leaving the church and about youth in the church. Um, and the my question is sort of what was the conversation about Catholic education at the Synod, both from the K-12 level and higher ed, but in the context of increasing enrollment in K-12 through Catholic education, increasing enrollment here at LMU, but also these culture wars that we're seeing play out in the classroom and in education? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say um, that there was not much because it was kind of about church qua church. It was about the church. And so what would, what did come up, though, a lot was, it's a little different, was formation of lay people and priests, so catechesis. So that was much more of a topic than, you know, actual Catholic education. Uh, and then, of course, in some countries, they don't have as vibrant, you know, kind of Catholic schools as, as we do here. So more about that, more about that than, more about formation than education, yeah. Um, I will end with one funny story, because the Synod was not just all serious, and there were really... And I know we've been focusing on the, the guy who left, and it was joyful, and it was exciting to be with these people, and hopeful, and wonderful, and interesting, and every day I walked into that aula, I was excited. I thought, I can't believe this, you know, and there's the Pope up there. The Pope would be sitting just by himself. One day I came in, and the guy, there was the, the, the head of communications for the Synod office, a Frenchman, very nice, very nice guy named Terry Bonaventura. And I walk into the aula. And by the way, all the Swiss guards salute you if you're a priest or a bishop. They they click their heels if you're a bishop. And I walked in with one sister once, and she was like, they're actually saluting me, Father. Um, <laughs> that's not the funny story. So I went in every morning. And uh, so Terry was, I have to end with a few funny stories. So Terry's outside, and he says, <laughs> he goes, your friend is there today. And I said, what friend? Go in and see. And it was Francis just sitting there. Now, remember, because there were 300, I was, I think I was telling the Jesuits who drove me uh, from LA Congress, because there are 350 people there, most of the people were cardinals, archbishops, and bishops who know the Pope, or they work there. So they're not going to be like fanboys or fangirls, which meant that there were just you know, a percentage of us who hadn't spent a lot of time with him. So he would just sit there and people would come up and talk and, you know, they give him presents and he, it was amazing. 
So in other words, like maybe five or 10 people there. And so one of the young people, this is not the funny story. One of the young people said to me, he was really lovely young person. There were young people there. And I mean, young, like this kid was 19, 19. Wyatt, he was great. By the way, he asked the Pope to sign a letter, which was on Vatican News, to his teachers saying that he's excused from his classes. And if you read it, it says, Wyatt, just, he was a really nice kid. The two youngest people, by the way, were from the U.S. Julie from Villanova was 22 and Wyatt was 19 from Wyoming. Uh, Wyatt, it's on Vatican News. Wyatt Pinky promises his teachers that he will make up his things. And it's signed Francis, you know, Franciscus. Um, so Wyatt said to me, if I, well, I'm not going to say that story. Um, anyway, so the funny story is this. So one day we walk in, this is like week three, and everybody kind of knows each other, right? I mean, it's, 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 it's enjoyable. People know each other and they're getting to know each other. Certainly you sit at a table at a, for a week at a time and you get to know people. Anyway, we go in and there's a sister named Sister Pat Murray, um, who is the head of the, essentially the umbrella group for all the women's religious orders. She's lovely. So Sister Pat, who was a delegate, again, this is a sister who had full voting rights, which was fantastic. She's wonderful. And she come, we come in and she has a huge black eye. Yes. And I'm, you know, she's probably like in her late seventies, whatever, a big black eye. It was really awful. And, you know, bandages and blood and right. So Everyone is around her like, you know, bees around a flower. You know, really, it was lovely. You know, what happened and how are you? So it turns out that someone punched her in the face. Yes. Um, and she said to me, not someone who was crazy, but someone who just punched her in the face. She had her sister's thing on and everything. I have to say, unfortunately, in front of the Jesuit community, we had nothing to do with it. Um, in any event, um, so it was really sad. And, you know, she's... She had bandages on. Okay, so here's the funny part of the story. So one of the great things was you could see the news being relayed up to the head table. The head table was, they were all round tables, but there was a head table where the Holy Father was seated with the members of the General Secretary of the Senate. And by the way, he was not running the, the, the talk all the time. One thing I do want to say, I'm sorry to go over, I do want to say this. There was a presider at the Senate who would call on people, you know, next, I mean, ends uh, so-and-so or sister whatever. Often it was a woman who was presiding. And one bishop said to me, Father James, they never call me Father Jim. Father James, do you see what's happening? We are at a, at, at a meeting at the Vatican where the Pope is present and he is not in charge. A woman is in charge. So it's really powerful. Anyway, Sister Pat comes in and you could see the news being relayed. You could see it. It's a big flat outlet. You could see the news and it gets up to Cardinal Grech. And someone taps him on the show. You could see it, taps him on, and he looks over and he goes, oh my gosh, and you could see someone explaining what happened. And he taps on the Pope's shoulder. And the Pope goes, oh, and he says, come here. And so Sister Pat comes all the way up. Everybody claps. I'm getting moved. I don't know why it was so moving. It was very moving to see like this community. Um, and anyway, the Sister Pat goes up to the Pope and he gives her a huge hug. And then she bursts out laughing. Now, like any good journalist, I thought I'm going to find out what he said. <laughs> so the next day, Sister Pat comes in. She's fewer bandages, but she still has this big black eye. How are you feeling? Blah, blah, blah. So we're talking, we're talking. And I finally said, what did he say to you? And she said, now, now as an aside, what would you expect the Pope to say? He would say, well, you know, suffering is part of life and our Lord suffered. And, you know, thank you for, thank you for this. And I've been praying for you and stuff. Oh, Francis said to her, you know, I can even it out if you want by giving you another one, you know? <laughs> so that's the way he is. He's just, he's just wonderful in himself. And the great thing was she loved it. She loved it and she laughed and she just loved it. And so that was kind of, for me, that was really also the spirit of the synod too, the sense of, uh, jo joy and community and Pope Francis kind of leading us all in this just wonderful exercise. Anyway, thank you very much for coming to me. Carol, thank you so much. For those of you who are, um, just to let you know, we do have uh, a little reception behind this building. It's a little wet out there, but I think you'll be fine underneath the awning. So please join us for there. And there are also, uh, Jim brought 
I think we have about 25 copies of his new book, Call Forth, which uh, he's happy to, you can purchase and he's happy to sign. So again, I want to thank both Carol and Jim for being here and all of you for coming out this, tonight as well. Thank you very much.